The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our God who creates us, redeems us, and makes us a holy people. Amen. I wonder if you heard about this thing that happened last week. Um, in Oregon, the state of Oregon, the Josephine County Public Health Team concluded their day of giving vaccinations. They were returning home to administer their last six doses, which had already been transferred from deep freeze into syringes. They had a six hour window before the vaccines would expire. All was on schedule until a car accident in the middle of a snowstorm brought traffic to a standstill and stranded about 20 public health personnel on Highway 199 in the state of Oregon. So what did they do? Did they sit in their cars and stew and complain until the vaccines expired? No. The team members left their vehicles and went car to car knocking on the windows, offering vaccines to other stranded drivers. One man was so ecstatic that he got out of his car and took his shirt off in the middle of the snowstorm so the team could inoculate him. Another woman was so taken aback, she could hardly sign the paperwork because she was trembling from excitement. The last person was a woman who didn't make it on time to her vaccination appointment earlier that day. That is an astounding story of public health officials committed to their mission. It's as, as though they were saying, we have something so valuable, so important, that if people can't come to us, we'll, we will go to them. It's so unconventional and outside the box. And it calls to mind for me, the reaction in our gospel of those in the synagogue who heard Jesus teach. They were astounded at Jesus teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes in the New Testament are kind of a caricature along with the Pharisees. They play the role of leaders who are all about maintaining the laws and following the rules. They worry about institutional survival. Had the public health officials in Oregon been more concerned about the institutional survival of their Department of Public Health, I wonder what would have happened. They may not even have had access to their imaginations and what 
kind of possibilities were there before them in those difficult circumstances. Jesus was all about bending or if necessary, breaking the rules if that would better serve his mission of love, justice, and healing. In the Bible, there seems to be two types of authority. There's external authority and internal authority. External authority comes to someone because of the role in which they serve. In our time, we see external authority given by an organizational structure or an institution. It comes by rank or position or elected office, or it is recognized by a uniform or a badge or a stole or a collar or a white coat or some other symbol. When we are deceived by those with authority, we have a crisis. We become torn between respecting the office the person holds and not respecting the person who holds the office. Well, the scribes had external authority. The other kind of authority in the Bible is internal authority. Internal authority comes not from any role or position or uniform, but from God. In 1964, which was shortly after TLC was founded, the Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart tried to explain hardcore pornography by saying, I shall not today attempt to further define it, but I know it when I see it. That's kind of what internal authority is like. It doesn't come from a position, but we know it when we see it. We automatically respect it. We fear it because we know in some unexplainable way that respecting and fearing this authority is the beginning of wisdom. And wisdom, remember, has emerged as one of your core values. There are some organizations, for example, where the custodian commands more authority than the official designated leader. In an ideal organization, the internal authority of the leaders is in alignment with the external authority of the position bestowed upon them. That's what happened on Route 199 in the middle of the snowstorm in Oregon. The leaders with the external authority had internalized the organization's mission and would abandon convention in order to accomplish the mission. Jesus had no degrees, no titles, no credentials, no uniform. But Mark, Mark's gospel says, the people in the synagogue were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Jesus' authority was not granted by an institution or bestowed because of an office he held. Rather, it came through him from God. It was an authority people responded to out of their experience of him. It was an authority that even has power over unclean spirits. It was an authority driven by Jesus' mission of love, justice, and healing. We are going through a discernment process as a congregation so that God's spirit can make this kind of thing happen in Fenton through TLC. My dream for you 
is that you will be so clear about your mission that you will be like those public health workers in Oregon. Your authority to do this will be internalized. We have something so valuable, so important, that if people can't come to us, we'll do whatever it takes to go to them. And I am happy to tell you that you have support for this from the whole ELCA. Our umbrella denomination, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, is onto this with an initiative called Future Church. As I'm learning about this, as I read it, the church gets it. The key word is activate. The way the public health officials on Route 199 were activated. Our church's prayer for this initiative is activate each of us so more people know the way of Jesus and discover community, justice, and love. The initiative includes three priorities that support similar goals that are emerging in the work of TLC's transition team. One, to be a welcoming church, engaging new, young, and diverse people. Two, to be a thriving church, rooted in tradition and radically relevant. I love that both and nature of that, to be rooted in tradition and radically relevant. And three, to be a connected, sustainable church, raising the bar together. Bishop Elizabeth Eaton says, we know the real, powerful, intimate love that God has shown every one of us through Jesus. That's the only reason we want to engage in this mission and ministry. And I love this. She says, you've probably heard it over and over and over again, as have I. How can we get more young people into the church? And she says, and I always ask, why do you want to do that? And people say, because they're the future of the church. They have energy. They're going to keep the church going. And she says, those are all bad reasons. The only reason we should invite anybody to church is so that they too might experience this freeing love of God that we receive in Jesus through his death and resurrection. And that's just poured into us by the spirit. She says, maybe when we're feeling weak or uncertain, maybe when it doesn't look as though we're making any progress whatsoever, nevertheless, that's the mission. So that others may know the way of Jesus, which is the way of love, which is the way of reconciliation, which is the way of service, which is the way of justice. So, I believe this all depends on internal authority, not external authority. This experience of God's love is our authority. The mission of sharing that love is our authority. The problem is we tend to default and trust external authority more than internal authority. This is a huge occupational hazard for pastors. And I have succumbed to it more than I am proud to admit. We settle for paying attention to butts and bucks, 
butts in the pews and bucks in the offering plate. We settle for focusing on institutional maintenance and survival at the expense of focusing on mission. Why are we doing this in the first place? We settle for our own preferences and agendas when we could be partnering with God and embarking on untold adventures. Ironically, that focus on the externals is kind of like those unclean spirits paying lip service to, to Jesus. It's kind of like a vaccine that prevents us from getting the internals. Finally, meet Bob Benson. He was a kid who went all by himself to a church picnic. When it was time to eat, he sat at his end of the table and spread out the bologna sandwich that he brought. The folks who sat next to him brought a feast. Fried chicken, baked beans, potato salad, homemade rolls, sliced tomatoes, pickles, olives, celery, and two homemade pies. That's what they spread there next to him while he sat with his bologna sandwich. But they said to him, why don't we just put it all together? He was embarrassed and he resisted, but finally he accepted their kind offer. So he sat there eating like a king when he came as a pauper. One day, it dawned on Bob that God had been saying that sort of thing to him all along. Why don't you take what you have and what you are, and I will take what I have and what I am, and we'll share it together. He began to see that when he put what he had and was and is and hoped to be with what God is, he had stumbled upon the bargain of a lifetime. That's the power that came in and through Jesus as he was teaching and healing with authority in the synagogue. God's power. Benson says it really amuses him to see somebody running along through life, hanging on to their dumb bag with that stale bologna sandwich in it saying, God's not gonna get my sandwich, no siree, this is mine. And the point is not that God needs your sandwich. The fact is you need God's chicken, not to mention the pie. Go ahead, Benson says, eat your bologna sandwich as long as you can. But when you can't stand its tastelessness or drabness any longer, when you get so tired of running your own life by yourself and doing it your way and figuring out all the answers with no one to help, when trying to accumulate hold, grasp, and keep everything together in your own strength and authority, gets to be too big a load, when you begin to realize that by yourself, you're never going to be able to, feel, to fulfill your dreams, I hope you'll remember it doesn't have to be that way. You have been invited to something better. You have, been, you have been invited to share in the very being of God in and through Jesus. As we consent to God's presence and action in our lives, 
individually and collectively, we stop striving for that external authority to be bestowed upon us. Rather, we rest in, with, and under the love, the grace, and the power of God. Amen.